right, well, hello everyone and welcome to Renegade Con. This is super exciting, Renegade. We are throwing our own convention so that you all can be part of our family. And there is going to be a lot of Renegade people around and there are a lot of Renegade partners around. And one of the best ones, one of the first ones is definitely Ivan Van Normer of Hunters Publishing. Welcome, Ivan. How are you today? Hey, it's great, Chris. Thanks for taking the time to to you know hang out with all of us and you know bring out Hunter's Entertainment into this uh, giant fold. I have to tell you, years ago when uh, Scott and I talked about this over at PAX <laughs> Unplugged years ago, we we didn't really know that it was just going to lead to like a co-publishing deal, but um, it's fun. Like we're it's the best of both worlds at this stage. We're making games and getting them out into the world. It's pretty fun. It so. is. It's kind of awesome, <laughs> right? I mean, we're, yeah. <laughs> and you're putting out really interesting and fun stuff. And it's, Thank I you. think it's kind of funny that you mentioned PAX because that was also where you and I got to meet for the first time. That's right. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. I know that's one of the things. And it's kind of fun that we're doing RenCon now because all of those experiences that you happen at uh -huh. conventions where you're meeting new people, getting into groups exactly. in order to play games, like we're trying to replicate all of that process in a virtual environment so it's certainly not the first virtual con that's tried to happen in the world right now but it's definitely one where we're making the biggest effort possible to actually make it feel like you're experiencing a large group of people all at one right. time even if you're not in the same room exactly so it's you know the goal is is to be big and fun to have panels to participate to have demos yep. i mean we want to do it all. <laughs> do it all. Do it all. Have big games with cool shows and, right. uh, you know, have run demos of games so you can just pick up and walk into a lobby and be like, hey, who wants to play a game? And someone will have a virtual table set for you ready right. to go. Exactly. And of course, you get to try all the latest and greatest, the hottest stuff, yep. things like that. So you're running some demos here. You're going to mm -hmm. have a lot of RPG demos. You're running yep. some cool stuff, too. Like, uh, I know we, we've been in talking about like the different systems you're going to run, and I'm excited mm -hmm. To see how yeah, I mean, there's it. a ton. And it's the case, like the entire, ostensibly we have the entire Hunter's library um, available for RenCon, at least everything that's that's in a position to be talked about at this stage. Right. So um, Kids on Bikes, Outbreak Undead, um, Icarus, and uh, we'll probably even have some Altered Carbon if everything nice. goes well. In fact, I'm sure it's happening or it's going to happen in this case. Uh, you know, so the point is, if you're looking to play a role-playing game, you can go hop into our lobby and then just say, hey, I'd like to play blank. Or if you haven't already pre-registered for a game, just go and figure it out now. Like it, things are things are occurring naturally. And just like a con, walk-ins are always appreciated. Oh, so. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Hit this Discord. Go check in, find a GM and uh, mm -hmm. get in on a get in on a quick little one shot and uh, why not? And have some fun. So the other fun thing we're doing here is we're gonna be doing panels and yep. you know we, we decided that it would be good for Ivan to do back to back. We'll do the interview, give him a quick break <laughs> and then throw him right into a panel right away. So why not? Why not? <laughs> it's what we do. It's what we do. But I'm excited because it's kind of how, you know, how is RPGs affecting the world that we're now living in? And and I think they're, they're kind of blooming and blossoming and they're really starting yeah. to shine. It's just funny. But it just shows the persistence of the collaborative storytelling um, mm -hmm. phenomenon that has been occurring in like the last uh, decade or so and how like not even a pandemic's really going to stop that process. Exactly. It's a. Uh, it's it's fun because people still want to tell stories around each other. It wasn't one of those things where it's like, oh, okay, well, that was a fun fad. You know what I mean? If anything, it's right. shown us that people really have a desire to want to interact, um, talk to each other, tell stories with each other, and that that's that's something that's inherently humanly natural for us to do and it's not just the, the you know the current hot video game that's currently right. making its round on reddit right now you know I mean? so, hey, yeah. we're, we're, we're looking at you we, we know exactly what, what, what one you might be talking about um i just i don't know in in this time i just can't i don't i don't feel right playing a video game but i feel completely fine playing rpgs like to the point where 
we're in the middle of a kids on bike game, which I'm really excited okay. about. How's it going? It's going well. It's uh, it's really fun. We're using Roll Twenty, uh, which right. is you know preset already ready to go. Did and, you get uh, the Roll Twenty compendium? Uh, not yet, not yet. That's coming. Uh, we, we it's probably... up in there if you want. If it, okay. the good news is that the Roll Twenty compendium is. Um, uh, okay, bud, you can go get water in, in your room, okay? See, that's, that's the other joy of doing gaming nowadays. But the, um, the, uh, the Roll20 Compendium is actually up on, um, for kids on bikes right now awesome. as well, too. So if you want to get the entire rule book, like literally everything that you would need from, in order to play kids on bikes in Roll20, you could go to their marketplace and pick it up right now. And it's ostensibly like having a linked PDF rule book in your roll 20 with oh, all nice. the different kind of stuff inside. So it's great. I mean, they're, I mean, <laughs> um, trivia and Amber from roll 20. Uh, I was charmed when they were like, yeah, we can't handle the influx right now of <laughs> everything that's happening. And then on sadly trivia got, got sick um and they didn't get anything like like covid or anything like that but they were sick for a little while so they were kind of like the mat the, the inbox is huge we're gonna get back to you it's just everything's <laughs> oh, nuts yeah and it was, but i was just was i was so happy for them but i also like felt for them so hard right <laughs> yeah you know? uh and that's just that's just the world yeah because why not um it's 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 great. It's a it's a great application. It's a lot of fun. I love the way Discord integrates with it. So, you know, it really kind of helps simplify it for you know people who may not be able to you know pull off a full studio with you know internet, TV, and everything. <laughs> it's easy to get and it's easy to get lost in tabs. So yeah. the more you can, and you know, people are trying to refine the technology, so to speak. Sure. But right now, I'm still in the position where, you know. For example, say like a combat round, you know, mm -hmm. we all know that it could take an hour to do 30 seconds of combat in a role playing game. Well, double that time in virtual tabletop. You sure. know, it's just it's it's a lot. There's a lot more um, elements and hurdles that you have to go through when it comes to communication mm -hmm. interaction. But that I would say that that gap is getting narrower and narrower as we are continuing to define and refine the technology so <laughs> excellent no it's very cool it's uh yeah. of course we started our campaign and like i think back when we started it you had literally just announced kids on brooms and I was oh cool just like yeah i i am super stoked because um i yeah it's great adding spencer into that mix like doug and john are already amazing game designers but then adding spencer stark into that equation um they should be very proud of what they put together because cool. they they really they really did like take the system and add just a very satisfying amount of mechanics to it that really does make you feel like you're playing you know uh magical adventures and enchanting schools and it's, right. it's pretty cool the magic system and it's pretty on point. So, yeah. you know, I'm and that's to probably got to be like, I mean, I'm sure that it would be natural to think, oh, we can do that right after. But then you start to realize that that's got to be like peeling an onion, right? Like to get to the center of the magic system. There's a lot to that that you have to oh, sure. develop. Well, under, the development on these things, they do not take a short amount of time and they do take a lot of right. um, pruning and effort. And I'm sure there's going to be whole conversations in the panel just about making RPGs. But, you know, it's <laughs> it's a different bag. Like the, the difference between producing a board game and producing an RPG, while there are very strong similarities, especially when it comes to production, the actual development process is it's it's different and it's different in a mm -hmm. way that it's like yes rigorous play testing will be needed for both but it's also just about how these products make you feel and how you get into it and how to enjoy things like pacing and preparing your players and your game masters because you you don't just have players in a board game right and you know some board games like mysterium will have like a storyteller like character or a gm like mysterium or you know um even like a uh, the legacy style games where they will unlock certain stuff down the road. But in a role playing game, you really are preparing the game master uh, as much as you are preparing the player and how to play the game. And it's kind of like having two different audiences. It's like, it's like, um, actually what it's more like is building a textbook that the teachers and the students can both read. 
<laughs> right. Unless you're yeah. going to write two completely different ones, right? Which they do. Right. Game Master's Guide and Player's Guide. <laughs> you know, but they it's, do not, exist. it's not super efficient, right? And, you know, it's you're now. It's OK, but it's fine. It just depends on how much information you need to provide to them to cram down their throat. If you're going to, you know, do a 400 page book, then you right. should probably split it into two books so that your players and your GMs can compartmentalize their learning a little bit cool. <laughs> versus handing them a tome. Awesome. <laughs> so so let's let's roll back a little bit in time and um, okay. let's kind of yes. like I think a lot of people know you from Geek and Sundry and, you know, kind of growing out of the, the original tabletop days. Like I remember Dread, um, uh, you know, with the yeah. giant with the giant tumbling blocks because we can't use that word. Right. Um, it's fine. <laughs> but I, I learned remember to, that. to dance that legal line ages ago. So, yeah. yeah. The, nobody That's pays fun. attention to the Internet. We've learned that, right? <laughs> Dread, Dread, is, uh, Dread is still to this day one of the most brilliant systems out Absolutely. there. It is so well made. And God, I still uh, to this day, I'm like, OK, you know, is there anything else that really engages that visceral like heart pumping element and i haven't i haven't found it yet there have been ones that have been close <laughs> but you know dread it to this day still holds that it number does. one slot and I, I love the ramp right because it starts off it's all like oh pull a block you're like yeah whatever <laughs> and then next thing you know they're like pull two and you're like okay and then you're like wait a second now i have to start deciding What's important and what's not, because it, it gets hairy very quick. And oh, I think so good. If you have a good GM who can ramp that, it's it's a fun uh, system. Uh, inevitable failure is my favorite <laughs> escalation system right now. And and I'm trying, like I said, it's something I'm continually fascinated by. Awesome. And uh, developing inevitable failure is, is kind of a thing I want to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been running fiasco nights, so I completely understand and love that. So right. totally. Yeah. So how do um, we get from how do we get from Geek and Sundry to Hunter's Entertainment? What was the journey there for you? Hunter's Entertainment came first. Did if it? I'm being honest. Yeah. Okay. So we we started Hunter's Entertainment, which actually was back then Hunter's Books. It was just okay. Hunter's Books. Uh, that started as um, a company that just me and a couple college buddies put together because we were obsessed with zombies at the time uh we were in college so it was around 2007 2008 when like the reboot of dawn of the dead came back sure. um and uh the zombie survival plan like mac brooks's zombie survival plan was just being published and everyone was talking about their zombie survival plan right like that was the hot conversation is what would you do in apocalypse that kind of a situation and and we were both fascinated by it too and you know crystal arosa um you know our fraternity buddy was basically like you know yeah i've been working on this game you know kind of been playing around with it because he was just doing it for fun and, and we both read it like me and my business partner at the time were like this is awesome. We need to do this. <laughs> and we did our due diligence. We walked around. We looked at other games. Like, was anyone else doing this? And at the time, All Flesh Must Be Eaten was not even in print anymore. They weren't doing any reprints. There was no copies available. And they were the only other real zombie game on the market. Okay. And we're like, wow. Okay. Well, we're going to do it as the survivalist point of view. And... I think this gives us permission to go forward. So we started a company and we started the company the day that I was, I like didn't even tell them. I, I'll remember to this day, I, I met up with them. We all met up to, you know, do our game dev session. And I told them, okay, so I booked us Gen Con. We're going to Gen Con and we need to have the book and we need to have the game done by then. And everyone was like, <laughs> it just and got real <laughs> just got real and and that's what and that's ostensibly what happened like we all booked our plane tickets and we all worked on getting the game done and we basically that was around january so we just had eight months to finish the game and get it printed and get it to gen con and we did by the skin of our teeth wow but we but we did it and so that was the first year hunter's books came into the world and it's it was only sold at gen con it did really well for like a first edition first publisher book it was a black and white interior chris 
Oh, oh so wow. You know, c- color cover, but black and white interior, uh, like a $60 book. Like, I mean, it, that was even a different time in the game industry too, like around, you know, 2010, um, 2011, that kind of a situation. But I mean, we were still making mistakes because it was our first book, sure. but yeah, we just kept that company going and it became kind of like a nights and weekends um, extravaganza for us. You know, we continued to work. I started working in developing um, in marketing and things like that, working in the video game industry and working in client relations and stuff like that. And, you know, my business partner, Chris, um, he was a graphic designer. He worked at like Netflix and MGM for a while and he kept working on games. And it just was a fun thing for us to do while we did our real jobs for a while. <laughs> and, um, and then about three or four years ago, uh, we, we had a real success. Um, we found, well, two, actually two things happened. The, the second edition of Outbreak and Dead was just starting to percolate and we're like, okay, well, it's time to update the game. Like it's been out for five or six years. We should update okay. the game. Right. And then I, I ran into John at uh, Gen Con and was like, hey, are you doing anything right now? Like anything interesting? And he showed me kids on bikes. And I was like, we would be I would love to be able to do that with you. And um, between that and that and then the fact that we also had a couple of art books that we had lined up, we we had the uh, we were humbly um, accepted to do the first couple of critical role art books like the okay. chronicles of Alexandria volume oh, okay. one, um, the giant, like 13 and a half by, yeah, um, huge, those huge books, you know, so we, we produce those for them. Um, those first couple ones before they did their deal with dark horse as well too. So kind of overnight, we went from being like a one brand, company into like now we have kids on bikes <laughs> now we have critical role and now we're working on um icarus shortly afterwards and so we went from basically doing all these little things and kind of just enjoying the nights and weekends funds of it to like becoming a legit company overnight and um wow. and it hasn't stopped <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't stopped at <laughs> all uh yeah so i mean that's kind of uh, the long short of it it was it was fun and then and then in the meantime geek and sundry yeah that was growing like i was starting to work with geek and sundry and working right. in that place and i was becoming a host and and that all happened because i was working in marketing and then I had a friend who was like, hey, we need to run a crowdfunding campaign. I know you've done a couple of those. Can you come in as a consultant? And I'm like, yeah, OK, well, sure. And so I go in and do the meeting. And no one told me that it was going to be with Will Wheaton and about tabletop. So, oh, so I was went, that the, the huge season three run? That yeah, the season three Indiegogo campaign. Gotcha. So, so I ran that campaign for them over nice. the course of like a year and a half. And that's how I got my foot in the door over there and just kind of started doing work because, you know, I really liked it there and, and no one kicked me out. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they don't kick you out, that tends to be like, I'll just, I'll stay longer. I'll move my coffee yeah. cup in. I'll, you know. It's just, yeah, you know, no one's using this desk. Let me just. There we go. And then, yeah. And the good news is it, it was just, there was a lot of opportunity and availability to do things. And I tried to just be as helpful as possible. Awesome. And, and it became, it became a thing and it was fun. It was super fun. So it's interesting because, you know, at the time that tabletop crowdfunding campaign was probably the <laughs> largest board game related campaign ever run at that time. That yeah. At the intense. time. Yeah. I think it was, God, when was that? 2012? 12 2013, or 13, yeah. No, thir- yeah, what? No. Oh, I have to go. I have to go. <laughs> it was definitely oh, wow. a while ago. It was, that thing was a monster. Yeah, it was 1.3 million. I do remember it ended up living around that territory, and it was just a very different, um, it was just a very, it was different. That was when crowdfunding was still fresh and young. Right. Sure. All the early adopters were were basically doing it and not a whole lot of people knew um, exactly what was going on with it. So, oh, geez. Well, um, then I would argue that in some ways you are responsible for me getting into board gaming because my oh. <laughs> coming back into the hobby is a direct you know, result of tabletop and what it brought. So especially season three, because season three was the one where, you know, you did the 
We did that. Lanterns. That's yep. when Renegade was starting their whole process because it was Lanterns was one of, Ren- one of Renegade's first games. Yep. Uh, which yeah. began a long relationship with Geek and Sundry and us. So that's awesome. So yeah. how did you get to the point where... 2014. Know, 2014. That's when okay. it was. Yeah, six years ago. Wow, feels longer than that. Doesn't it, though? <laughs> it feels a lot longer. Uh, sorry, continue. What were you saying? mug, so yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah. I actually have my. In fact, it's hanging up on my board game. I've got the plus twenty to tabletop. The nice. plus twenty to making tabletop sticker it still hangs out on my board game shelf. Gotta so. love it. So awesome. That's great to hear. So how did you? So you're you're kind of at this point. Things just all of a sudden start sprouting and growing. Um, how did you come to get into the the Renegade family and kind of become that? You know, kind of a huge part of our RPG arm, as it were. I, you know, to be fair, Scott and I, we had just had pleasant conversations, both professionally and personally over the years, ever since we started with Hunters. And really, I didn't get to know him too well until we, I was really active with the GNS hosting and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had just been talking and he knew me more as just like one of the hosts of Game the Game at that time. And, uh, but we were talking about it and working on tabletop. I had the opportunity and the pleasure of working with Sarah, who is one of the easiest people to work with (laughs) on the planet. And, um, you know, building a relationship there, working on tabletop day. And uh, yeah, I mean, at one day we were just kind of, he just kind of talking to Pax and he was like, so what are you doing right now? What are you doing with stuff? And we're like, yeah, well, you know, these are the things we're working on. These are some of the challenges we're dealing with right now. And he's like, yeah, I can help you with that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. And uh, it ended up being a conversation, which just ended up kind of developing into a, a, a kind of a co- like that's what we have. We have a co-publishing agreement. Right. So when we put these games out, it's like Renegade and Hunters are working together in order to bring the games out into the world. And it's it's different. Like it's not like the traditional you know, developer publisher kind of a situation that you see in a lot of client relationships like you look at other companies and they are clearly the publisher and they are clearly the developer right and -hmm. that's a little bit of a hierarchy um in this circumstance it there's it's a rare thing in which we're kind of coming together and both saying okay well how can we move all boats forward um at the same time cool so what are – so if you're not familiar with Kids on Bikes, Kids on Bikes is a wonderful role-playing game. Kind of kind of harkens back Stranger Things, Goonies, you know, bike adventures of the 80s and 70s. Strange and, adventures in small towns. Yeah, exactly. It's just like when you, when you didn't have a cell phone and you got everywhere on your bike, which is, you know, kind of – kind of the name right makes sense it's nostalgic and it's fun and the good news is is you remove things like cell phones and pages and technologies from the business you've removed a a lifeline to civilization to a lot of your party as well too which makes life easier or makes things more spooky (laughs) (laughs) it definitely can go there if you want uh and it's it's just this really fun system the dice allocation system is very interesting uh because it's literally using one one value from every die and you assign that Mm -hmm. die to a category so if you have brains you got brains and you you get your d20 and brains then and you got a good chance so it's a very unique system but i i'm pretty sure you have some pretty cool other systems that that are laying Mm -hmm. around maybe maybe even on demo here now um what's some of the best ones you got well i mean so yeah kids on bikes is definitely like one of those one of those kind of games where um you know it's very inspired by like games like savage worlds and and powered by the apocalypse right. where you have uh you do like you like you said you have that skill allocation but yeah there's other ones too like one of the in-house games that's developed by chris is is now called the hazard system and it's kind of like taking the outbreak undead game mechanic which is a roll under percentile system Mm -hmm. and um merging that with some of the cool storytelling rules light elements like kids on bikes have around the the skill dice allocation okay so altered carbon is kind of a weird marry between both of those games which is awesome because kids on bikes is very much about like okay rules light hop into the game quick storytelling but you know doesn't do a whole lot when it comes to like 
combat or conflict, right? Mm. Versus Outbreak Undead, which is really for like the hardcore enthusiasts who want to replicate their zombie survival plan, um, but also, you know, basically has different stages of learning in the game, everything from arcade mode all the way up to survivalist mode. You know, um, so altered carbon is a marry between the two, where uh, you have a roll under dice mechanic with skill dice allocations. So you're still not like you're saying brains, brawn, all of that, but now you're being associating die with these things. But the best dice are the ones that have the lower sides. So like a master dice is a D4 because you're okay. attempting to roll under a target number, right? And the worst dice you could roll is a D20. Um, because the odds are more likely you're going to roll over that target number and then everything kind of living in between. So, um, and I think it's, it's one of those funny things that it, at least in kids on bikes, it was a little deceptive because you think, Oh, I put a four in there. I'm, I'm going to suck at it, but it also has exploding dice. So exploding dice, 25% mm -hmm. chance you're going to explode. And then another 25% yeah. chance you're going to do it again. And Which is <laughs> super fun. And then in a, uh, in alter carbon to, to, uh, kind of like do something different, but have a similar fun experience around sure. it. Um, there's, uh, there's luck and there's, there's luck. And then there's things like bonus dice. So, the extreme results, if you have a skill dice and a, and a luck dice um, and you roll them together, um, a, 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 a very good luck dice is a D4 because you're likely to hit the extremes. You know what I mean? But the – well, let me, let me kind of just say it like this. So if you have a luck dice and your skill dice and your luck dice are both either the extreme lowest number, which is the success, or the extreme highest number, which is a failure – that's where you get a critical hit and then like a critical fail. Gotcha. Ostensibly, we call them catastrophes, right? <laughs> um, or or like strokes strokes of luck. Uh, and you're probably not going to get those on luck dice if you do ones mm. that are farther away from the extremes. So rolling a D4 luck dice is pretty common because cool. it's it's either going to ridiculously succeed or it's going to ridiculously <laughs> fail kind of a situation. Always so, both fun occurrences. <laughs> yeah, always a join no matter what. So yeah, so that's that's one of the systems. The, another one that we're developing in-house right now is, um, is another one that we aren't really like talking too much about, but oh. it does use D4s aggressively okay um yeah which is, is great just, are you just going to call it caltrops so that I, basically <laughs> caltrops the system i know and then i know that the one that everyone wants to hear about right now but we aren't in a position to talk about now is, is werewolf you know right so there's there's a lot of conversations about how we're doing with werewolf right now but we're still having conversations with paradox about how we want to roll out that information right. at this point but it's been very fun to um to watch people like chris and elisa go and look at elements like v5 and say okay how do we make this werewolf how does right. this still how is this still world of darkness but how do we make it werewolf and it's very cool it's very fun to watch them work it's exciting. And I think, you know, one of the things that really kind of drives every game that you make, I mean, it drives RPGs in general, right? Is the the concept of role playing. But the I love that you your games seem to really focus on the storytelling and the role playing. Like it seems to it's, really it's, be a focus. It's so funny because people do get caught up in the and it, it to be fair, it is an easy way to communicate. It, the word crunch, right? They use it in board yeah. games all the time too. Mm -hmm. It's like, how crunchy is the game? How many rules do I need to learn? Yeah, you're right. You know, more rules uh, is is a lot to absorb, but with more rules comes more agency in role-playing games. Mm -hmm. You can do more or you feel like you can accomplish more things that you own what you're doing um, when you have more rules. Like it's literally the difference between rolling a dice and accomplishing this giant narrative block or basically saying, yeah, like my my choices that I make in character creation and how I built my character and my stats and my skills matter in the game. You know, that's that's what's interesting. So we try to make it so that it's more about how you feel when you play the game. What is how do mechanics inform feelings? And you know, this is this is this is a great thing that John does in his game design as well too. He's always about experience first, right? How does it feel to play the game? Um, and when games like Outbreak, where you want survival horror to be matter, how can you make it so that you are spending resources without thinking about it? But then by the time you spent all your resources, you're like, well, what do I do? 
You know what I mean? Mm. How do you invoke that feeling of like with preparedness and with good skill, with good skills and tools, you have a better chance of survival um, versus kids on bikes where it is very much about, you know, uh, you know uh, succeeding amongst adversity and about trying to replicate like those quirky little successes and adventures that kids have when they're in this place right. or Icarus, um, which is, a single die roll in the entire game, but you're building a historical narrative plot over the course of the entire uh, game, hmm. which is which is wonderful. Or Altered Carbon, which is explicitly neo noir cyberpunk, right? <laughs> how do you how do you make it feel like you're playing a noir storytelling game, but also has that like action packed cyberpunk? You know, I'm shooting lasers at bad guys kind of an attitude. So. How cool was it to get that property and have access to it? Because that that's a pretty high commodity right now. That's fun. I mean, licenses. We been we had been fighting the license uphill battle for a long time, gotcha. and we knew we knew that we wanted a license a long time ago because that's when you start developing a lot of original properties. At some point, you're like, okay, we want to try our hand at a license. And and Chris and all of us at the Hunters team, we were like, okay, we're ready. We are ready for a license. So just a matter of what. And we bid. We bid for a lot. Like we went out and tried it, and were turned down. Um, time and time again, just because we weren't in a position where, you know, we were really appealing to okay. a lot of uh, a lot of licenses at the time. Sure. But also, you know, we we had the chops to be able to make it happen. And then Altered Carbon comes along and they're like, yeah, you guys know what you're doing, you know, and they saw that Chris, um, again, my business partner, he had worked on uh, on a lot of the billboards for the actual seasons of the okay. show. Um, when he at his at his day job at the time, and uh, it was kind of fun. We had we had built a really strong relationship with Skydance right from the ground up, cool. and and that was just a great opportunity to kind of continue to be like, okay, now we're going to do this, and we're all fans of uh, the series as well too. So we came in not just like picking a random license off the shelf. We knew we were going to do some fun stuff with Ultra Carbon. Um, and yeah, and now, now it's like, now we're working on the Osaka book and the Johannesburg book <laughs> and the Birmingham book. It's like, nice. we're actually getting into places where we get to expand and elaborate on the lore and other parts of the world now. Like the, the series explores Bay city in the first season and then goes immediately to Harlan's world in the second season. But we're like, yo, we got a whole earth here, <laughs> lots of different metropolitan cities. Like okay. you're going to need to give us time to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it is definitely in good hands. I'm excited. I've yet to, have you, I'm, I'm going to oh. flip through some pages. I kind of saw some stuff, but I, have you seen any of the book yet? Mm. Maybe, maybe. Well, I'll show, I'll show you some of the book if when we're in there. Like if you need to take a chance. <laughs> and I forgot, I do have this on my desk right now. I posted it on Twitter, so Twitter up earlier, but this is the the cortical stack. Oh, nice. um, it's the it's the active player token that we featured as part of our our crowdfunding campaign. And this is uh this is one of the early early prototypes I got. So when you're determining who gets to go in combat, um, this is this is and you back the Kickstarter, uh, you got basically a chance to grab one of these. So nice. they're super cool. You know. Awesome. We're, we're here at the beginning of the con. What are you kind of looking forward to? What's something that, you know, when this is all done, we have to clean up the mess. The wrappers are there. Um, what do you what, <laughs> yeah. what do you hope happened? What was something? I'm looking forward to not having to clean up and pick <laughs> up all the wrappers everywhere. <laughs> I tell you, I, I love uh. <laughs> working booths. I love meeting people. Um, I, I really enjoy, you know, I don't even mind setting up, but man. Breakdown's rough. <laughs> Breakdown's rough. Every time breakdown's rough. Honestly, I'm looking forward. I, you know, I'm just looking forward to hanging out in the Discord and kind of people watching. Yeah. Um, as people are coming in and grabbing games and going out of it and just being available. I'm looking forward to the panels. Cool. Um, usually panels are like one of those, oh God, I have a panel in five minutes. I need to get over there. Um, but I'm just looking forward to kind of like casually spending time and and frankly like hopping on the, the the various voice channels and actually having a chance to talk to people like I'd like encouraging the people who i would go to cons with and like making that voice channel to be like hey you want to like hang out maybe hop up 
tabletop sim and play a board game or you, you know or or just or just run something like i haven't run altered carbon for any of my friends yet and oh. it'd be nice to be able to do that and frankly it'd be nice to bust out some of the things that we're prototyping now as well too and try that out so well there you, you know. go so so lots of fun ahead be sure to check the discords and everything because God only knows what's coming. But speaking of panels, you do have to get to one because you're yes. up at uh, 8 o'clock my time. So uh, I think this is a great place to call it. And uh, yep. thanks so much for spending a little bit of your uh, your evening with me and getting to know you a little bit better. This is this was a blast. I enjoyed this a lot. I appreciate it, Chris. You're doing a lot of hard work, and I, and I appreciate the time, effort, and energy you're getting into to try to make this happen right now. So thank you. Yeah, this is uh, this is exciting. This is my baby. Let's uh, let's have some fun. So. <laughs> All, right, All right, take care, man. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you next time. And uh, I think we have some more interviews coming up tomorrow. So should be sure to check them out and check out Ivan at the RPGs in today's world panel coming up next, right here. Thank you. Good night. Mm -hmm.